Human cloning has caught the public imagination for generations. The idea of being able to take one human being and duplicate them is, well, on one hand it sounds like science fiction, and yet it happens 4,000 times every day in nature. And how's that? Well, when a human egg is fertilized by a human sperm, those two cells fuse, they become one flesh. And out of that comes a ball of cells which eventually grows into an embryo which implants inside the mother's womb and eventually we have another human being being born. Now, in nature we see twinning as quite a common event. It's when this particular ball of cells splits into two and you land up with two identical people, identical clones of each other, being born in a totally healthy way. Now, you can replicate artificial twinning, and Dr. Jerry Hall did this back in 1993 in Washington, and he showed that it was relatively easy to take a physical ball of cells and to separate them, to manipulate them in some way, to encourage them to fall into two pieces, or even more pieces, and that each piece would then tend to grow on into what looked like a viable human being, although he then destroyed his embryos at a very early stage. Now, although some said, oh, this is fanciful nonsense, and he would probably damage the embryos in the process, the fact of the matter is, as I say, that nature does the same task 4,000 times every single day without any untoward consequences. Now, the other way that we see twinning in nature is when we have two eggs being released at the same time, uh, which is again a natural event, it happens often, fertilized by two different sperm, and then we get non-identical twins growing up in the womb. And through fertilization technology, when we're trying to encourage a woman who is having difficulty in conceiving uh, by giving her drugs to stimulate her ovaries, in that kind of situation, these kinds of multiple non-identical twins are really quite common. And indeed, it's quite a controversial side effect of the process. But, you know, the real controversy about human cloning has not been over these kinds of technologies. It's been over the thought that we could use the same technology that was used to clone Dolly the Sheep in the late 1990s to clone an identical human being using an adult who's already alive. How does that work? Well, it's actually relatively simple. In theory, in practice, the failure rate is catastrophic. So here's the theory. You know that in every one of the cells of your own body is a complete set of your genetic code, the code of life which makes you you. I say almost every one of your cells. It's not the same in sperm or in eggs, um, and it's not the same in red cells which don't have a nucleus. But in every cell, like a skin cell or a brain cell, a liver scale, a cell or a bone cell, then you will find that this is true, that inside that bag there is a nucleus. Inside the nucleus is all the genes that we need to make another one of you. Now, most of those genes are turned off in most tissues, so that in the skin, only skin cell genes are being activated. In the heart, only heart cell genes are activated. And indeed, we thought this process was fixed more or less uh, at a very early stage while uh, uh, you, you were developing in the womb. And these cells then become determined. We say they can't do anything else. They are fixed in their own identity. Now, we know that that isn't quite as simple as we thought, but that's how we used to understand it. What the cloners of Dolly the Sheep discovered was this. If you take a cell from an adult, in this case it was a frozen cell from an adult sheep, which is an interesting possibility, which we'll come back to, but if you take a, 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 a cell from an adult, you remove the nucleus from it, you throw the adult cell away, and you get hold of an unfertilized egg, you remove the nucleus from the egg, which only contains half the genes necessary for life, and you throw that away. You then put the new nucleus from the adult cell inside the egg, and an amazing thing happens, uh, which is that that egg starts to act as if it's fertilized. How do we do it? Well, the technology isn't so difficult, and such experiments have been done in frogs for many, many years. And they've been done successfully in a wide variety of mammals. And some have claimed very successfully too in human embryos. And one or two organizations have claimed that they've actually managed to produce a healthy cloned child. But there's been no proof of that. That is, as of the time of making this video, in June 2007. So how do you actually do it? Well, if you take a 
a, a mammal egg. It's, it's huge in relation to a normal, say, mammal skin cell. It's full of all the nutrients that's needed in order to produce that first ball of cells. It's, a bit, it's got a whole lot of yolk and cytoplasm, if you like, a bit like a, a hen's egg. And it's quite easy to work with this big cell. You take out the nucleus and throw it away. What you then do is you put an adult cell, which is actually usually much smaller, against that unfertilized egg and the two attaching. You then put two tiny electrodes, one either side, one touching the egg, one touching the adult cell, and fire the tiniest current, electrical current, across it. As that happens, these two eggs, well, the egg and the adult cell, suddenly fuse. If you imagine two bubbles on, in the bath and they suddenly become one. And what happens then is that the nucleus from the adult cell, the skin cell or whatever cell you took it from, finds itself inside the chemical bath of the egg. And the chemical structure of that egg has all kinds of messages in that which are firing up the genes of this adult cell, turning on all those genes that were turned off for perhaps one or two decades. And that adult cell then will start to divide, uh, or rather its genes will start to divide, using the nutrients of the egg, and it starts to behave as if it's been fertilized, and you get another person. Now in practice, doing this procedure is very inefficient, and can result in unexpected side effects. For example, many of the cows that were cloned in the early stages of these experiments uh, turned out to have quite severe problems. Many were malformed before they were born or died shortly afterwards. And we suspect that the risks to human embryos or human beings of being cloned in this way are pretty catastrophic. The failure rate is certainly vast. It needs huge numbers of cells and a large number of experiments. But there are people who will be committed enough to have a jolly good go at it and they have had many attempts already. Now, most of the scientists who are involved in human cloning technology would point out that they are not interested in the slightest in making an identical copy of you, even though there are strange people around who would like that kind of thing done. One woman wrote to me and she said, I would like to have my dad as a baby. I would like to see that he goes on in the world. Another couple wrote to me about the son uh, who had been tragically uh, uh, brain damaged at birth. And now he had died. They hoped that tissue from his body could be used to clone him again so they could have their baby again and see what Mark would have been like had he not been brain damaged. Now, you can only begin to imagine what the psychological implications could be for children in such a situation. Um, let alone the uh, physical risks to the well-being of a child through this cloning technology. But as I say, scientists don't really want to use it for that reason. The vast majority of scientists want to use human cloning technology for medical research purposes. And they have argued, especially in the UK and other, some other countries, that medical technology, medical progress, will be aided enormously if they are given permission to do this kind of work. But are scientists actually right? Do they need to use human cloning technology to find cures for things like multiple cirrhosis or motor, motor neuron disease, diabetes or other illnesses? Probably not. And that may be one of the reasons why human cloning technology has not attracted much research funding over the last few years. Almost all of it has been going into straightforward embryonic stem cell research and from there it's been shifting into research using adult stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are th those taken from an embryo in the early stages. These cells are omnipotent. They are able to give rise to just about everything you could possibly want and more. The problem is controlling them as they are set for vigorous growth and can easily develop into cancers, creating all kinds of problems. The other problem is rejection because the cells themselves are not identical genetically to the adult who may need them. Then along comes a separate kind of technology using adult stem cells. Now in the past we thought that adult cells were almost all determined, they were fixed, that certain genes were fully turned off and that would be the case until the day that you died. That it would be impossible, for instance, to persuade a bone marrow cell to become a useful tissue uh, as a component part of, say, heart muscle or brain tissue or to help repair the spinal cord. We now know that that's not the case. 
that there are cells in many different tissues which have the capacity to convert into other kinds of tissues or perhaps not don't convert directly but to produce substances which themselves accelerate healing or local organ regeneration. Now we see this quite routinely now. Uh, we've seen uh, a woman who uh, was found to have male cells inside of her brain after she died. These were presumed to have arisen from the male bone marrow transplant that she received as part of her cancer therapy some years previously. We've seen other examples where bone marrow cells have been able to uh, form a useful component part of the healing process if heart muscle. We're not sure exactly how this happens, but we're seeing an explosion of research studies suggesting all kinds of really exciting things are possible using these adult cells. Uh, we've seen uh, partial repair of spinal cord in animals. We've seen uh, repair of brain tissue that's been damaged after animals have had strokes. Uh, there are other scientists who are working on uh, rebuilding the uh, light-sensitive part of the eye, retinal cells. These cells are damaged in things called macular degeneration, which is a common disease of those who are old in America, Europe, and just about everywhere else. Scientists are using these kinds of cells in animal studies to regrow the retina, and these retinal cells, which are derived from either embryonic stem cells or in some studies from adult stem cells, they reattach themselves to the optic nerve so that the uh, animal uh, regains partial sight. These are spectacular advances that would have been considered to be totally science fiction even in, as, as uh, recently as 1999 or 2000. And we can expect further progress here. And all this is leaving the human cloning industry looking rather last century. Because what research scientist will want to take money uh, to do work uh, where they, he could land up in prison doing that work uh, in many countries uh, using embryonic stem cells or cloning human embryos when you have the chance of doing almost exactly the same kind of thing using adult cells taken from the person's own body which can be put back into the person's own body without any risk of rejection or just about any other problem. So expect to see further dramatic improvements in adult stem cell technology. Now there are those that uh, uh, sit on the backside here uh, and, and say, well, you know, it's all very well, Patrick, but it's rather theoretical and uh, we don't see it happening or it's quite difficult or there's a lot of hype about adult stem cells and we really think the action is in embryonic stem cells. Well, that's true, that's still the case, but as I say, watch out, the situation is changing. And even a moment's thought tells you why uh, it, it, it should be so. The only real difference between uh, an embryonic stem cell and an adult stem cell, as we have seen, is which genes are active in that particular nucleus. And as we've seen from adult cloning technology, when you take an adult nucleus where most of the genes are turned off and you pop it inside the chemical bath of, a, of, a, of an egg, uh, then straight away all of those genes, or many, many of them, are activated in a way which will give rise to an, a, an identical clone of that in original individual. Now, once you understand that, you begin to see that the whole trick in terms of converting, say, an adult skin cell into something that's more flexible, or all the way back towards something which looks and behaves like a human egg, it's all to do with the chemical messages around the nucleus. And that, once you've realized that, is a tremendous open door for new advances in science. Because if you can find what those chemical messages are, then perhaps you don't need an egg in order to produce a clone of someone. You could just go straight, in theory, from a skin cell to a skin cell plus the chemical bath, uh, to a skin cell which is now fully activated and ready to become a clone of an adult. Now what is missing of course is the large cytoplasm around that nucleus which gives the cell the energy to form its initial ball of cells and get ready to implant and before it can get its nutrients for the future through the placenta from the mother. But nevertheless it's an interesting thought and that's exactly what scientists claim to have done recently uh, with uh, various tissues where they got the cell, found the chemical triggers, and seen it regress. Um, and many, many scientists have done this in different ways, with different results. And different cells 
only need to be progressed a certain amount in order to go off another path. Other cells need to be regressed much more substantially. An example is liver and pancreas, which in embryology terms, in development terms, they arise from a very similar part of the embryo and the fetus. And uh, people like Professor Jonathan Slack at Bath University some years ago have shown that with certain chemical triggers, you don't need to do too much in a liver cell to activate genes which turn that cell effectively into an insulin producing pancreatic cell. And they've done the, he's done this in tadpoles and he's been experimenting and doing this with human liver cells. Fascinating. So we're partially regressing a cell and then pushing it up another path without taking it all the way back to the embryonic stage. But as I say, you're going to see and hear an awful lot more about this and in the process the human cloners those who are wanting to do it for research purposes will find themselves, I think, looking more and more last century. What will we be left with? We'll be left with a few people who are still trying to use human cloning technology to do what some pet owners are doing and try to duplicate existing human beings or people who are dead. Dead? Could it be done? Well, yes. I mean, Dolly was cloned using frozen tissue. Dolly's mother was dead long before Dolly was even created. So in theory, we already have the technology to produce a new human being who is an identical twin of someone who died many, many years ago, whose cells have been perfectly preserved uh, through a special technique uh, in a frozen state. But that is the future. The thing about the future is this. Not everything that can be done will be done, and not everything that will be done should be done. Either we take hold of the future, or the future will take hold of us. Either we have these debates now about how science should be used, so that society has a chance to come to terms with what it wants for the future, and can regulate and bring a big debate about the progress that they want to see, or we will find these things are foisted on us by one announcement in the newspapers after another. And by the way, not everything that is being done is being published. For a long time now, there's been a significant gap in some laboratories between what some scientists have felt comfortable about publishing and what they haven't. And one of the reasons is that there's quite often a large emotional reaction within the public, which they fear, and that is why some results have been kept back. Dolly the sheep was an interesting case in point. Dolly was already several months old before the world was told that she'd been born. But Dolly had been made several months before she had been born in the first place and the research itself was well underway months and months before then. So why the gap? Several reasons. One was to register patents, register patents. Uh, the other was to uh, be sure uh, that the technology had actually worked and that Dolly was healthy and so on. But what I'm saying is the headlines are often a long way behind the reality. So that's why we need to think ahead, think clearly, have the debates now and decide what the future will be.